So in my last video, we talked about a way of measuring really thin things. Today, I want to attack a completely different problem and show you how to measure small things instead. In my opinion, this is a way cooler setup and neater physics going on, but it's a little more complicated. We're still going to utilize the wave-like nature of light, but in a very different way. This setup is called an interferometer. You may be familiar with it. It's an incredibly sensitive scientific instrument that lets us measure things in the order of atoms to nanometers. Here we can easily make out the displacement of this actuator that's moving five nanometer steps. This is so incredible considering we're at home and using surplus parts from the 80s I got off eBay. One of the coolest parts of an interferometer setup like this is what I would call the dynamic range. Most tools that let you measure nanometers or microns or atoms will work over a short distance, maybe only have a few microns or millimeters of throw. This thing can measure nanometers from across the room from feet or meters away, which is totally incredible. You may be familiar with a Michelson interferometer, which is a more traditional setup. These are a lot simpler to make, but have worse performance in basically every way. This is known as a heterodyne interferometer, and it's so much more robust, has better re resolution, and there's basically no reason not to use it if you can scrounge all these parts together. Unlike a Michelson interferometer, they're completely invariant to ambient lighting conditions. Check this out, it's actually incredible. As I turn the room lights off, there's basically no effect on the measurement. This is just the ambient vibration and noise in the system. Ideally, this would just be sitting at zero nanometers happily and not moving at all, but every time I touch something, it'll basically go crazy, and it's hard to get rid of these vibrations when we're outside of a billion dollar lab. Just to give you a quick scale of things, this tenth place here is basically atoms, and 8,000 nanometers is about the diameter of a red blood cell, 80,000 nanometers is the diameter of one of your hairs. So this noise we're measuring right here is imperceptibly small. I have this about 20 feet away from a road, so it's not that often, but when cars do go by, it completely ruins the measurement I'm trying to do. The idea is that it measures the displacement between this surface here and some remote mirror. Just for demonstration, I have the mirror only about an inch away, but in reality, you could put it across the room or on some moving linear stage that you want to measure the, the position of. All this stuff on the left here generates a red laser beam, and that beam comes out, goes through the interferometer, hits some remote surface, and the reflected beam goes into this detector assembly and then into some electronics. It's kind of difficult to get everything aligned, even with proper optical mounts and things like this. It's hard to convey just how sensitive this setup is. Keep in mind, the only thing we're measuring is the displacement between these two faces here. So in theory, if I touch or manipulate anything on the other side of this table, we shouldn't expect to see anything on the computer. In reality, if I tap the table, even pretty lightly, we see a massive spike on the output. Likewise, if I touch the back side of this mirror, as lightly as I could even imagine, we see an output, uh, I see a large spike on the output. Everything is mounted rigidly to this thick aluminum plate, and yet, even if I touch a stainless steel standoff on the opposite side of the table from our actual measurement going on, we can still see fairly large spikes on the output and changes. This gives you an idea of just how impressive modern semiconductor machines are, that they're able to maintain this precision across hundreds of wafers, months of operation, and you know, sub-nanometer accuracy across all the features on a given chip. The mirror whose displacement we're measuring is actually hot glued onto one of these piezo discs that are found in like guitar pickups or speakers. When we apply an electrical signal to this, it'll grow or bend a few tens of microns. We can hook up that piezo actuator to a handy amplifier box I made. This takes some analog voltage input, multiplies it by about 27, and then outputs it to the piezo. This box can do up to 150 volts peak to peak, which is super useful. So I'll flip it on, and we can notice right away the displacement has a nice sinusoid here. I'm, I'm inputting a sinusoid of one volt peak to peak to this box, which is 27 volts output uh, to that piezo. You can also hear it's making this kind of terrible noise. I'm not exactly sure why. But of course, we can't see any motion at all on this mirror. We can change the waveform, of course. We can do like a square wave. A triangular waveform. We're measuring in the microns here, but when there's no human around and the system's given a few hours to settle down and come all to the same temperature, uh, I can VNC in and control this all remotely, and I'm able to measure these waveforms below one nanometer, which is so incredible. If I talk too loud, it'll actually screw up this measurement. I've let it all settle down, and we're measuring displacements here of about two nanometers. 
it's not only vibration that'll screw up this kind of measurement. Also, if I put my hand near it or if I breathe on this for any period of time, it'll warm up the air around it, change the pressure, humidity, and temperature, which changes the wavelength of the laser and totally screws with our measurement. Interestingly, a heterodyne interferometer works quite similarly to a police radar gun that they use to pull you over when you're moving too fast. This system, contrary to what you might be thinking, doesn't directly measure displacement. It actually directly measures velocity, and then we're kind of doing an integration to get to the uh, position or displacement of that remote mirror. The laser you have to use for this is the most special part of everything. It's huge, but it only outputs about a milliwatt or less, and in my case about 200 or 300 microwatts. It's a helium neon laser, so there's a glass tube in there full of gas, and the wavelength is 632 nanometers, but it's very precisely regulated. Inside of here, there's a few special things that make this irreplaceable by like a laser diode or anything like that. There's an assembly of magnets in the laser tube that through the Zeeman effect allow you to split the optical frequencies. Normally when you think of a laser, you think of perfectly coherent light that only has one wavelength coming out of it. This laser has two precisely controlled wavelengths of light. Red light is on the order of 600 terahertz in frequency. These two different frequencies coming out of the laser are within about one and a half megahertz of each other and they're perfectly aligned beams. Achieving that one and a half megahertz split on a 600 terahertz frequency is incredible precision. In addition, there's either a heater or a piezo element that allows the laser through a feedback loop to stabilize the cavity length by heating it up or moving that piezo mirror. And by stabilizing the cavity length and using these magnets, it's able to generate an incredibly precise and incredibly stable um, optical frequencies coming out of it. The difference in frequency between the two wavelengths that this laser produces are turned into a reference signal generated within the laser itself. I can plot that reference frequency, which is about one and a half megahertz, and we can use that to see when the laser is warmed up. The manual says that it should warm up in about four minutes to its you know, total stability, but I'm not seeing that in mind. It takes hours normally. I'm not sure if that manual is exaggerating the truth or if I just have a really old laser. In any case, we can see the reference frequency of the laser starts to rise initially when we plug it in, and then it oscillates a little. This is that piezo element or that heater inside, modulating the cavity length and kind of stabilizing things out. But eventually, the, label, the laser stabilizes, and then over a 30 second frame, we can see it's stable below 100 ppm. Okay, that's cool, but how do we use it to actually measure the velocity or displacement of this mirror to measure what we want to? We have this reference signal, which is frequency A minus frequency B, and that's preserved, that's already into the microcontroller, and we can measure that nicely. So the beam of known optical frequency content goes this way, containing wavelengths A and B. It goes through the interferometer and hits our remote mirror. Without loss of generality, we'll say that wavelength B is split off and goes into this reference cavity. We're able to do that because early on, wavelengths A and B are linearly polarized orthogonally to each other. Since they're polarized like this, later on in the optical train, we're able to use a, another polarizing filter to select which of these wavelengths we actually want to direct where. It's a nice trick. Wavelength B is in this reference cavity. It bounces around and then comes out and then goes into a detector photodiode. All the reflected beams out of the interferometer are directed at a downward angle so that rather than going back to where they came from, they go into this detector photodiode right here. Wavelength A goes straight through and hits our uh, remote mirror. Due to the Doppler shift, we now have A and we'll call delta A superimposed on each other, where delta A is the shifted frequency. So then we have A and delta A coming back through the linear interferometer and combining with uh, B that just came out of this reference arm and going into the measurement photodiode. When you look at this diagram and try to get a deeper understanding of this, Anytime you see two optical paths that are aligned on top of each other, they end up interfering. And the result of that is that the two frequencies add and subtract from each other. So you end up with the sum and difference of that frequency. It's just like a heterodyne radio receiver, if that analogy makes any sense to you. If you're more of a mathematical person, you can think of it in terms of a trig identity, or think of it that multiplication, which is this overlay of frequencies in the time domain, is equivalent to addition or convolution in the frequency domain. That's where we get the sum and difference of these parts from. In any case, at this photodiode, we're left with a laser beam that has three optical components, A, B, and delta A. Our original reference signal has two components, A and B. So if we subtract the two signals and manipulate it in the right way, then we can just be left with just delta B, which is the Doppler shift frequency that we're trying to measure, and that can be sent onto a computer or FPGA for more processing. When I said the beam goes through the interferometer and just hits the mirror, that was a bit of an oversimplification. 
That would work, however, but in LIGO, the gravitational wave observatory that you've probably heard of in the news, they bounce this laser back and forth many, many times to improve the resolution. We can do the kind of the same thing here. If I slip the piece of paper here, we can see there's actually two beams that are impinging on our remote mirror. This interferometer is meant to have a single pass, basically. But if you remove a cap here and you replace it with this, I have a little 3D printed one here, but if you replace it with a retroreflector, you can modify it so that the beam hits the remote mirror, goes back into the interferometer, and then bounces around once in there, and then hits our mirror again. So that way you can actually double the resolution, or half, I don't know, make the resolution better by a factor of two, just by having another pass at it, basically. And then the resulting beam, like before, goes into the photodiode. Building setups like this is, kind of feels like Legos. Everything's modular, and you can screw it together with these nice quarter 20s. I picked up all these optical parts on a lot from eBay, it'd be a fortune to buy all these clamps and stands and things individually new. If you do have to, Newport and Thor Labs and places like that are pretty good, but uh, you know, it might be on the order of $50 for a stand or a clamp or something. So it adds up really quickly. You can find these lots though, if you just go on eBay and search for like optics lot, I don't know, something like that. Speaking of eBay, this guy, Silicon Sam, who's surprisingly not me, sells complete kits for this sort of thing. He has a couple of options, one with the genuine HP laser, which is more of a plug-in and play setup, and then one with the kind of do-it-yourself Zeeman split laser, where you have to add your own magnets, which seems like it's pretty fun. If you haven't also seen his website, I'd highly recommend checking it out. It's an amazing knowledge base for laser-based projects and information on measurement setups like this. And so nice that we have access to these things for free. The same guy on eBay sells the kit for this, which is, he calls the UMD-1. It's basically a pair of serial differential line receivers that clean up that incoming differential signal and send it to the microcontroller. There's then some Visual Basic software on the computer, which uh, allows you to get those plots and data you saw before. This is that software. You could easily make your own controller and, and own software, this, but this one works, this one seems to work pretty well and is not all that buggy. Without interpolation, like a stock system like this, should theoretically only have a resolution equal to the wavelength of the laser or one half the wavelength, which in my case is 300 or 600 nanometers. So without interpolation, we actually see a screen more like this. And if I induce like vibration on my table, we can get the same spike, but our resolution is highly degraded. One way to do this interpolation is basically phase detection. If you can pretend that these are the reference and measured signals coming from the interferometers, so this is like frequency A minus B, and then this is A minus B with the delta A in there as well. While the remote mirror is in constant velocity, you expect a constant offset in frequency uh, of that measured signal with respect to the reference signal. The constant offset in frequency means that it's going to appear to be slipping past. There's going to be a continuously changing difference in phase. A common phase detection circuit used in PLLs and things is the XOR operation. So if you take the exclusive OR on these signals, it'll make a third signal that is high whenever the state is different between these two. So when they're perfectly in phase and when there's no slipping here, that's represented when the mirror is stationary, then our XOR signal will be a zero. And then anytime that this starts to slip, the timing difference between the rising edges of these will be the pulse width of the XOR signal. So then that's really easy to do in an FPGA or, or a microcontroller or something. All you have to do is measure the pulse width of the XOR signal basically, and you get the phase difference between these, therefore the velocity difference. And then in any of these methods of characterizing or, or reading these signals, you end up sampling it at discrete times and adding it to a counter. And what that basically does is a form of discrete integration. So we're getting from velocity to position, and that's how we actually get these dis displacement values on the computer. I mentioned before things like temperature can affect the system greatly, and that goes for all environmental factors like temperature, humidity, and pressure. I've actually seen data sheets and manuals and things cite an incoming storm front as a source of error. It's kind of hilarious. For a scale, a one part per million error in displacement here can be caused by a one degree C change in ambient temperature, a two and a half millimeter mercury change in air pressure, or about an 80% change in relative humidity. One part per million doesn't seem that devastating, but for some of these measurements, it's totally a game over. Therefore, it's really advantageous to measure all these environmental factors and correct for them. The main effect of temperature, humidity, and pressure is the wavelength of the laser. It's pretty sensitive to these things. The secondary effect would be the thermal expansion of the aluminum plate that I have everything mounted to. 
as ambient temperature changes throughout the day, this expands and contracts, changes the lengths between my mirrors. So even, that, even though there's nothing moving here and everything's rigidly mounted, we can still see drift throughout the day. I've got a little microcontroller back here with a bunch of environmental sensors, and we can plot that data. Temperature is shown in these traces. It's almost perfectly sinusoidal with a 24-hour period here. It's pretty interesting. You want to do your experiments here, here, and here, where the derivative is closest to zero of the range of temperature. I'm in a temperature-controlled garage with air conditioning, but it's, of course, it's not perfect. So this is smoothed out to about a degree of change, which is pretty decent, all things considered. But one degree, one degree C across this four-inch distance I have here is on the order of microns of drift. So that's unacceptable for a lot of measurements. This data in real time is sent over to the software, and I'm able to correct for the wavelength changes of the laser. But thermal expansion in my materials are a little more difficult to characterize and to null out. I'm also measuring pressure and humidity, and that just is to correct for the wavelength uh, error. That's all I have. I hope it was a good introduction to precision measurements and interferometers and lasers and things for you. These experiments seem a little out of reach for most home experimenters, but there's simplified versions of interferometers that can easily be made um, with like 3D printed and laser cut parts. You don't need to go this extreme unless you have like a real application for it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.